Uh, what's this one? Um, so in choosing your environmental data, um, you want to think about the, you know, um, what the data that you have available, try and choose directly relevant to your, to your organism, but also consider how those data were made, what they are actually telling you, so what's the information content of that layer, okay? Just because it says it's temperature, we need to understand, okay, what is it that it's measuring? Um, the other things that, that we want to think about is what's the time of, what, what time is the environmental data coming from and whether that matches the time that your current data comes from. So um, this is one thing that we, maybe we can discuss a little bit later, but the potential for um, incorporating you know, 100 years of collection data and then looking at the last decade of climate data is that a realistic um, comparison. Um, and then last, last up on environmental data, I'm just going to talk briefly about um, uh, future climate scenarios uh, and uh, the way that these data are constructed. Um, so, I'm sure we all know about the IPCC and uh, as part of their reporting process, lots and lots of um, future climate um, uh, scenarios have been produced. Um, the reports are, well, long and detailed, but if we're going to use these sorts of data, it's worth having a look to understand the uncertainties in these data. Um, a quick point. Um, we need to also understand the difference between climate and weather um, when we're looking at these, okay? These are long-term average conditions and not daily conditions. So. Although with modern day uh, satellite information we can get day on day data about temperature for our area or precipitation for our area, when we're looking at future scenarios or paleo climate scenarios, what we're looking at is average long term conditions. Okay? So the temporal scale of our data okay, is uh, year, decadal averages rather than day-on-day -day fluctuations. So, um, we, we also keep, need to keep in mind that the future data projections have a whole bunch of parameters in them and there's a massive amount of uncertainty in these data. So, these are three three um, charts that I pulled from the last um, IPCC report. Um, and I think you've probably all seen it before, but um, they show that each line represents one model that's been run to look at future temperature. And this is like, um, <coughs> the lines show uh, global temperature change over time. Now, they start really tight in the present, and as you get further away from the present, you get this massive spread, so that the projected range of temperature change is somewhere between, uh, what is that, one degree and two and a half degrees, depending on which model you look at. So, there's massive uncertainty with these future climate um, data sets, and we need to keep that in mind when we use them. The parameters that are used, um, so there's, there's assumptions based on the amount of CO2 emitted in the atmosphere, and there are sort of different scenarios um, that are called, um, that are given these code names, B1, A1, A2, um, and these stand for different emissions scenarios. Uh, they originally gave them names such as, uh, I think A2 was something like business as usual, and B1 was something like um, uh, everyone um, 
I can't remember what it's called, it's like basically everyone stops um, emitting carbon dioxide right now. Um, and so they, they have different assumptions about the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and obviously that's going to affect the amount of um, uh, climate change. But alongside that, even, even the models within one particular scenario have different parameters and uh, different modeling methodologies, and there's uncertainty within each of those models. So there's a big spread of um, uncertainty on these future projections. And this is obviously controversial. The way that, the way that um, we construct our future climate data sets um, is interesting and worth considering. Because um, modeling the whole climate of the world is you know, it's, it's a computationally intensive process, uh, the data that we get out from these models tends to be relatively coarse grid because that reduces the computational effort required. Okay? So although our present day climate data is uh, one kilometer of 30 seconds, the future data projections, for many, many, many of them, um, are all done at a much coarser resolution. So when you download your data from WorldClim that shows future climate scenarios at uh, equivalent resolution to the present day, there's been some upscaling that's gone on in between the data that's output by the climatologists and the data that's available on WorldClim or Climate or whatever that we use. So the way that the way that these data layers are constructed is that um, you start with your low resolution future grid, okay, and then you take an equivalent low resolution present day grid, and you take the difference between them, okay, and what you then get is a low resolution grid that is, that represents the amount of change that has happened over this time, okay. Then, possibly at this stage, that low resolution grid is interpolated to a high resolution grid, or it's just added on to a present day grid. Okay? So, it's saying, what we're saying is, okay, we've, we've started at a value here, where the is temperature, four, it's going to be four in the future, currently it's five. So what I do is for this area, I say take the present day and subtract one. Okay? Now the well spin, the well clear projections take the difference, so minus one, and they interpolate to a high resolution grid. But essentially they just then adding the difference for the present day. Okay? So you start with a low resolution grid and you end with a high resolution grid. So, the variation within these coarse pixels is directly, directly relevant to the present day variation you see. So when you see future projections, um, you often see these larger pixels coming through on the images. So that you can see that there's a artificial squares around the edges of your projection, and these represent the coarse grids of the underlying um, uh, model, climate models. Okay. So when when we when we're looking at the output for our transfers in time using these upscaled um, future climate scenarios, we need to keep in mind that it's actually based on much coarser resolution data which has had some um, upscaling um, applied to it. But often that coarse resolution shows through on our data as artifacts. Yeah? Just a uh, terminology. I thought that when we move from a core resolution to a final solution in this way, yeah. it was a downscaling. Yes. 
So we put it outside. Upscaling. Upscaling. Okay. I don't know which way it's down. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I didn't know if it was that I even yeah. Okay. Uh, that, that's it. So, questions or comments? Uh,